What I'm going to say in this video will take a bit longer than most of my other videos. There's a lot of important ground to cover, and I want to do it in a way that will hopefully not be misunderstood. What I'm going to say will shock many people. It'll give some of you cause to think that I've lost my faith in God. But I'm going to back it up with what Jesus actually taught about miracles. First, however, I need to deal with some misunderstandings that have arisen over the centuries from a superficial reading of some passages of Scripture. These misconceptions need to be brushed aside before we can hear clearly what Jesus actually taught on the subject. We rarely recognize just how much our own selfish and sinful nature influences the way that we read things in the Bible. Take a look at this passage from the book of Acts, for example. It's Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost in reference to the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit on thousands of people on that day. This is that, says Peter, which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. Now let me ask you, do you get the impression from hearing those words that God had given his Holy Spirit to these thousands of people as a step toward enabling them all to do miraculous signs and wonders? It sounds like that, doesn't it? But before we assume too much, I want you to think hard for a moment about all those thousands of early Christians who are mentioned in the book of Acts, not counting the apostles. How many miracles can you recall them doing? Any healings in particular? It's not easy to think of any, is it? What I'm thinking of here are more or less traditional miracles, mostly miraculous healings. So I accept that thousands of people spoke in tongues. Many of them had the ability to prophesy or preach the gospel with some help from God. But I'm particularly thinking of the kind of miracles that most of us feel are not happening in the church today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 10 and 29 to 30, Paul says that not everyone has either the gift of doing miracles or the gift of healing. Let's look at Acts 2.43, where it says, Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Okay, so the apostles did miracles, but there is no reference to anyone except the apostles doing them. Even at the time, just after the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it was accepted that not everyone did miracles, that it was only the apostles who did them. That probably needs to be made a little more clear today. Now let's pause it there for a moment. I want you to take note that I'm not trying to twist anything here. I'm just trying to get us to see the bits of information in the Bible that our prejudiced minds have not wanted to see before. We want to believe that the early Christians were all doing miracles, and that one day we can as well. What a wonderful dream. We want to believe that such power is what the Holy Spirit is all about. The more Holy Spirit, the greater miracles we can do. But that may not be the case. Are you open to that possibility? Of course, it could be that the apostles did have more of the Holy Spirit than the others, and that's why they did miracles. Many signs and wonders were done by the apostles, remember? And listen also to these words from the Apostle Paul, the most famous of the apostles. It comes from 1 Corinthians 2.4. He says, My preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now, it sounds like Paul was saying that he had performed miracles wherever he went, and it was because of the miracles that people had responded so positively to his message. But let's do with Paul what we just did with the other non-apostles. How many 
Mighty Miracles of Paul can you list? Pause the video to make a list before you go on to see how well you remember. In fact, Paul did do several miracles that are recorded in the Bible. But it's not what he's remembered for, is it? This seems to suggest that the miracles that did happen were not so much for show as they were for specific needs that arose as Paul got on with his primary task, which was to preach the gospel in all the world. There was that snake, the one that bit Paul when he was gathering firewood after being shipwrecked. The Bible says that Paul was not affected by the bite. Then there was that time in Troas when a young man named Eutychus fell out of a very high window while Paul was preaching. He appeared to have died. The Bible says that Paul fell on him and embraced him and then announced to the people that he was not dead, but he was alive. In the 13th chapter of Acts, Paul miraculously caused a man named Elymas to become blind. And in the 14th chapter of Acts, he healed a crippled man. In the 28th chapter of Acts, he healed Publius' father. He also cast a demon out of a woman in Acts chapter 16. Finally, there's a rather strange passage in the 19th chapter of Acts, where it says that Christians from Ephesus took handkerchiefs and aprons that Paul had been using, and they gave them to sick people, and the sick people were healed because of it. We don't have any of the specifics, but if this is true, it does seem that some people were healed, even though Paul himself was not present when the healings took place. We don't, however, have any details of any of those healings. And that's about it for Paul. Considering how much is said about him and how much he contributed to the establishment of the early church, it is surprising that almost nothing is said about him doing miracles. He just wasn't known for that. But what about the other 11 apostles? Surely we should be able to compile quite a long list of all the miracles that they did. Or can we? Try it again. Stop the video and see how many you can list. Most of us would get as far as the lame man outside the temple, whom Peter and John healed. And then we get stuck. There are a couple of quick references to Stephen, Philip, and Barnabas doing miracles in general, but again, no details. In Acts chapter 9, Peter heals Aeneas, and he brings Tabitha back to life. There were other miracles that happened, like the earthquake that opened the prison for Paul and Silas but they don't seem to be directly attributed to any one person. We have only a few details of less than 10 healing type miracles in the entire New Testament after the day of Pentecost. So, far from being an endless account of miraculous healings, the book of Acts is fairly quiet about miracles apart from letting us know that they happened. I think there are two things that we should learn from this, and they tend to balance each other out. One is that God definitely did do miracles through at least some believers in Bible times. It did not just die out after Jesus went to heaven. And from that, I can conclude that God continues to do miracles today. I personally experienced three or four of what I would call genuine miracles in my lifetime. I didn't do the miracles as such, but God did, and I was blessed to be a part of them. Okay, so God does do miracles, both then and now, conclusion number one. But the other conclusion we should learn from taking a closer look at the book of Acts is that the miracles seem to mostly just be something between one person and God. They were not used to attract crowds or to generate a doctrine about the importance of doing miracles. It's like the miracles were almost taken for granted. They happened, or they didn't happen, without anyone skipping a beat. Everyone just carried on faithfully, with or without them. This seems to be particularly significant today, because the Bible warns that lying signs and wonders will be prevalent in the days before Jesus returns. The Antichrist and the false prophet will both apparently be able to do miracles. And there are so many clever magicians in the world today that there's hardly a miracle one can imagine which they would not be able to replicate. So it's very important for us to determine whether God really does want us to be doing miracles 
miraculous healings, raising the dead, that sort of thing? Or does he have something better for us? Is it that we ourselves are the ones who want to do miracles, and that we try to convince ourselves that this is what God wants from us? What we read in the book of Acts, and especially what we read in the various epistles written by people like Peter, James, and John, and Paul, are teachings. And none of those teachings seem to teach about miracles. Miracles happen, yes. But there was no fanfare and no teaching about them. Now please be patient with me here because I'm going to finish up with what Jesus taught about miracles. I just want to get things into perspective before I do. I want to look at a common trait that I see in so many people who write to me. Some of them say that God has done miraculous things through them. Others say that God is going to do miraculous things through them. And because of that, I should pay very special attention to what they have to say. Sadly, much of what they say just seems to steer me away from the teachings of Jesus and to put the focus back on them as God's special messengers. Where has this reasoning come from? I believe it comes from a common assumption that if we could do miracles, we would be able to accomplish so much for God. The world would stop and take notice. And a lot of so-called evangelists capitalize on this. They tell you that if you do this or that, then a mighty revival of miracles will result. They encourage you to literally claim a miracle, even when no miracle has actually taken place. And they compete with one another over who can tell the biggest yarn about the most incredible thing that God has done through them. Or Roberts used to boast that he had raised back to life 20 or more different people. But when it came to producing evidence of such a miracle, he went deathly silent, later admitting that he had not raised anyone from the dead. There are other evangelists who say that angels appear to them on a regular basis, giving them hidden knowledge of any number of things. And not to be outdone, other evangelists come along and tell you that they went to heaven itself and had a chat with a big boss, more or less, over a cup of coffee. All of this talk about miracles works because it's what people want to hear. The bigger the boast, the more people who will flock to check you out. But it doesn't appear to have been the pattern in the book of Acts. In fact, for the early church, it was exactly the opposite. Quite likely, there were a lot of genuine miracles that happened. But the right hand did not know what the left hand had done. No one talked about them. Isn't that what we just discovered as we considered how the topic is dealt with in the book of Acts? Ah, but what about the Gospels? Surely this is where miracles were happening by the hundreds, if not by the thousands. And this time we do have specific accounts of a few dozen individual miracles on top of statements that Jesus healed everyone who came to him, at least on a few occasions. Jesus told his disciples that they would do what he had done and that they would do even better things through the power of his spirit working in them. There are in fact several passages in the gospels which seem to support this belief that Jesus did a lot of miracles and that he wants us to be doing a lot of miracles too. So why aren't we doing them? Lack of faith could be a part of it, but you still have to ask yourself, why don't we have more evidence of the early Christians doing miracles? We have a lot of big name evangelists today who say miracles are happening all around them and they tell you that God will jump at your command if you just tell them, just name it and claim it, they say. But has any one of them even half emptied out a hospital? At best, miracles seem to be the exception rather than the rule today. And those who teach otherwise are repeatedly exposed as exaggerators, if not outright liars. So am I saying that Jesus did not do a lot of miracles? No, I think he did do a lot of miracles. But if he did it, for the purpose of attracting attention to himself, you have to ask yourself why he told so many of the people whom he healed to keep it secret. Does that sound like how it's being done today? 
If Jesus did not do it for show, then why did he do miracles? Mostly we don't know, but here's a clue from Matthew 20, verse 34, where Jesus meets three blind men. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. You see, Jesus loved people. Several times we read of him having compassion on the multitudes or having compassion on a widow whose son had died or having compassion on a blind man. In the story of the Good Samaritan, which Jesus told in answer to a question about how to inherit eternal life, by the way, he uses that same word, compassion. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where the injured man was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Interesting, isn't it, that both stories talk about healing, and both indicate that the healing is linked to love or compassion, not an effort to prove anything. In the second story, there's no mention of anything miraculous. So how does that fit with all the emphasis on miracles in the life of Jesus? Consider this. Jesus obviously had limitless power. The Bible says that he was there in the beginning of creation, that everything that was made was made by Jesus. If the virtual creator of the universe was present in human form here on earth, what would he do? The Bible says he healed as instinctively as did the Good Samaritan. It's just that when Jesus felt love, he reached out to them quite naturally in a supernatural way. At the same time, however, Jesus commends, rather than criticizing, the Good Samaritan, whose efforts were restricted to the two most basic medicines that were available in those days. Alcohol to stop infection, and oil to aid natural healing. Jesus presents this man's primitive nursing care as a good example of what it takes to inherit eternal life. Why? because it came from a heart of compassion. So, okay, now, I've finally reached the point where I will introduce what Jesus actually taught about miracles. Hopefully we can hear it a little better now, after all the introduction, because it is rather shocking, as I told you earlier. You can find this very same teaching repeated twice in both the 12th and the 16th chapters of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a miracle, but there will be no miracle given to it apart from the miracle of the prophet Jonah. Like so much of what Jesus taught, this teaching about miracles has been conveniently tucked away for centuries. And it's not just Pentecostals who are doing it either. The Catholic Church has exactly the same criteria as Pentecostals for measuring spirituality. In the Catholic Church, you can't be considered a saint until it can be shown, to their satisfaction, that you performed at least one miracle. And they claim magical cures coming from various relics in various sacred locations, like the so-called miracle waters of Lourdes. Statues that shed real tears and injuries to hands and feet that never stop bleeding are just a couple of the hundreds of magic tricks that they produce as evidence of God working through their organization. No, the televangelists have nothing on the Catholics. But Jesus said that all of this is pandering to what? Go on, repeat it after me. An evil and adulterous generation. Do you believe that? Do you believe what Jesus said? And do you see why I said at the beginning that the teaching would be very difficult for most of us to accept? Remember, I'm still saying that miracles happen. But whether they do or not is entirely up to God. It's only an evil and adulterous world that thinks they will solve the world's problems if they can just learn how to do miracles. Let's look at the second half of that teaching 
about miracles to see if it can help to make sense of what we're discussing. Jesus said that the only miracle that an evil world will receive is the miracle of Jonah. In one of the Gospels, he goes on to say that the miracle of Jonah being in the whale's belly for three days symbolizes him being in the tomb for three days. Is that the miracle that the world is going to receive? How can we possibly demonstrate or recreate the resurrection for today's unbelieving world? They'll never believe it. But maybe it's all that we need to believe. Look at Jonah. He never told the people of Nineveh about his miraculous escape from slow death and the belly of the whale. He didn't do anything out of the ordinary for the people of Nineveh. He just told them the truth. They were headed for destruction unless they repented. That's it, brothers and sisters. That's all we got to tell them. From both barrels, if you like. They are headed for hell if they continue on the path they are presently following. Both inside the church and outside of it. We are living in an evil and adulterous generation. And there will be no miracles on demand. Well, at least none that we get to tell them about. That miraculous escape was just between Jonah and his God. And it seems to be consistent with what we have been discovering about miracles as we have walked our way through the New Testament in this video. Miracles happen, but you don't get to talk about them. And they only happen to those who believe Jesus enough to obey him with or without a miracle. That's how it is with the Great Commission. Jesus tells us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Then he promises that miracles will follow. Do you understand what that word follow means? It means they don't come until after we start obeying. And on top of that, there seems to be nothing to imply that we control them. God does them as he chooses. If we think otherwise, then we lump ourselves in with who? The evil and adulterous generation in which we find ourselves today. Now, for some of you, that's going to be a huge challenge. You've been conditioned for years to think that it's all about miracles. Yet Jesus tells you that such reasoning comes from an evil and adulterous generation. Those pastors who have told you Sunday after Sunday to come forward and pray for some sensational manifestation of the Holy Spirit have been apostles of the evil and adulterous generation in which we live. Forsake them. Let them go to hell on their own and let them take all their lying signs and wonders with them. Believe me, brothers and sisters, they are never going to encourage you to obey Jesus. Every last one of those miracle men is a false apostle, an ambassador for an evil and adulterous generation. Let go of them and turn to Jesus before they take you to hell, where they themselves are heading unless they turn to Jesus and live. I know, it's not what a lot of you wanted to hear me say, but believe me, if you will accept it, then you can clear out a lot of garbage that is actually holding you back from growth in God's Spirit, from real freedom in Christ. Please pray about it and let go of that false hope so that you can catch hold of Jesus with both hands from this day forward. Now, before I end this video, I want to take a look at something which I said earlier. I said, Jesus told his disciples that they would do what he had done and that they would do even better things through the power of his spirit working in them. This passage seems to have been taken to mean that we Christians today should be doing something even better than Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. But how can we improve on that? How can you or I do anything more sensational than raising Lazarus from the dead four days after he had died? Now, consider this. Did Lazarus eventually die a second time? And did he stay dead that time? What I'm suggesting here is that every resurrection mentioned in the Bible, except for Jesus' resurrection, was temporary. The only thing we can do which is better than a temporary resurrection is an eternal one. Let me repeat that, and you think about it as I do. 
The only thing we can do, which is better than a temporary resurrection, is an eternal one. Now, let me draw your attention to another passage of Scripture. In the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about various gifts or ministries in the Christian church. Interestingly, he lists the gift of healing separately from the gift of miracles. In other words, the Good Samaritan may have been exercising a non-miraculous gift just by pouring oil and wine into the wounds of the man he found dying on the side of the road. He had the gift of healing. And then, right at the end of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says that he's going to show the Corinthians a more excellent way. Here we have it. A better way, more excellent than miracles, more excellent than speaking in tongues, even more excellent than prophecy. That is Paul's introduction to the wonderful 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the love chapter. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I'm nothing but a noisy gong or a tinkling cymbal. He goes on to say that all of the various manifestations of the Holy Spirit, whether miraculous or not, whether sensational or not, are like looking at something through a foggy mirror by comparison to this more excellent way. The more excellent way is love, the supernatural, divine love of God. Christ had that love for sure, but he wanted the same love to shine through each one of us that we might be able to reach the masses of the world with what they really need. Not the signs and wonders of an evil and adulterous generation, but the only real answer to the problems of the world today. Love. The powerful, transforming love of God. That's it. I'll leave it there. You can hear more about this in the video named The Greatest Command of Christ. I look forward to hearing from you and encouraging you to keep growing in Christ. Please write to me at the address on the screen now. And please share this video with others on the internet and elsewhere. Thank you for listening, and God bless you.